All right, here we go. So what I want to do now is I want to talk about uh, cardiovascular pharmacology, but instead of focusing on the pharmacology that you guys should be familiar with, I want to focus more on home medications. Okay, so as you're going through your patients, his, you're, you're doing the history and physical exam, and you're looking at their meds. Um, how many, at this point, probably a lot of you just write all the meds down and go, oh, figure it out. <laughs> Somebody else will figure it out, right? Um, but knowing at least classes and common names, uh, with, uh, characteristic examples of drugs within uh, classes can be real helpful to figure out, okay, what is going on with this patient? So what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, anticoagulant and antiplatelet medications, um, diuretics, um, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, um, lipid and cholesterol agents, and then uh, some uh, miscellaneous uh, cardiac medications that have antidysrhythmic um, activity. So you guys are okay with that? Those are the, the seven major areas that we'll focus. All right, so let's talk about beta blockers. And you guys, at least those of you in my farm class, should be pretty familiar with this, huh? Because we talked about these in some detail. Um, but you have three major flavors. You have your cardioselective beta blockers, your non-cardioselective, and your mixed alpha and beta, which actually fall more or less under the umbrella of the non-cardioselective. So really, you have cardioselective and non-cardioselective, and then you have this mixed alpha beta um, blocker that falls under non-cardioselective. So what do I mean by cardioselective? What does that mean? Beta what? Beta there we go. These are beta blockers that are more selective, are highly selective to the beta 1, um, but tend to leave the beta 2 alone. That's a good thing, right? All right. So here are some classic examples of common cardioselective beta blockers that you should be able to identify. Atenolol, metoprolol, and esmolol. All right, and what do they all tend to have in LOL? Yeah, they all tend to end in LOL. Um, that at least generic. Now the trade names. Um, a common trade name for atenolol is tenormin. A common trade name for metoprolol is lopressor. Okay, so you should be able to know that tenormin is atenolol and lopressor is metoprolol. There is a sustained release version of metoprolol known as toprolol XL. Very common, lots of patients take this. If you see this, that is a sustained or a slow release form of metoprolol or lopressor. Um, now, the only one of these medications that is not a home medication is esmolol. Esmolol is only given via a continuous IV infusion. Okay, and it tends to be patients who are admitted to the intensive care unit or um, are in the emergency room. What's that? Put your dog on it? Yeah. Yeah, we typically don't see a lot of humans taking that in oral oral form. This tends to be a very common ICU drug. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know. As long as she does okay with it, yeah. Um, so are you guys okay with that? All right. Um, can we give beta blockers? Are these within our scope of practice? Yes. These are solidly within our scope of practice. Um, do I need to put links up to your scope of practice again on Canvas? Or are you guys, do you guys, are you guys able to access it? Well, you have it in your, your book, first of all. Um, that material... Yeah, it came out of the, uh, the New Mexico EMS department. Now, those of you in my farm class, um, I gave you those links to, the, to the, the scope of practice and the treatment guidelines. Um, okay, yeah, so you guys have that. Okay, good, good. Um, so you can also access that online, but again, we, we put that in your orientation packet as well. Yes, so beta blockers are well within our scope of practice to give, all right? Um, they play a fairly limited role in EMS, okay, because we're typically not using them um, to do a whole lot. Um, 
Propranolol. Oh, uh, so let's move on to non-cardio selective. What is the difference between cardio selective and non-cardio selective? Yes. So non-cardio selective are beta one and beta two blocking agents. They block both beta one and beta two receptors. Okay. So what kinds of patients are we going to be very cautious with? Yes, reactive airway disease. Why? Right, because what do we give? What's our primary rescue agent for people with reactive airway diseases? Yeah, beta-2 agonists like albuterol, ipotropium. Well, ipotropium is an anticholinergic, but um, albuterol, um, leave albuterol or zopinex, okay, uh, terbutaline, those kinds of of those kinds of rescue agents. Um, if their beta-2 receptors are already blocked, it may be very difficult to treat their reactive airway disease. So we want to avoid giving these meds to those kinds of patients. The classic non-cardioselective agent that we see is propranolol or indorol. Okay, that is a classic non-cardioselective agent. Okay, and then you have mixed alpha and beta, and the one that I want you to be familiar with is labetalol. Labetalol is also known as normodyne. Okay, again, you want to use caution with reactive airway disease because this is all, not only does it block alpha receptors, and where are alpha receptors located? Yes, blood vessels. So this will cause some vasodilation. In addition to beta-1 and beta-2 blocking effects, right? So it's going to also affect the heart and the blood vessels. You guys, you guys okay with that? Does that, that make sense there? Okay, cool. So um, how do beta blockers work? They block beta adrenergic receptors, right? What do they result in? Well, they result in a decrease in your heart rate a decrease in conduction through the AV node, and a decrease in um, blood pressure. So what kinds of conditions do you suppose beta blockers are used to treat? Hypertension is a major one, absolutely. Hypertension, tachydysrhythmia, if somebody has some sort of tachycardic disorder, okay, beta blockers may be prescribed to slow their heart rate down. Congestive heart failure, Okay, beta blockers are useful in the treatment of chronic congestive heart failure, not somebody who is in cardiogenic shock um, and dying from it, but they, they are now chronic. And we sometimes will give these to patients that have had a myocardial infarction to prevent something known as remodeling. Have you guys ever heard of that term, ventricular remodeling? Is that a familiar term? Ventricular remodeling. In ventricular remodeling, what happens is the tissue will um, change in response to the infarction, okay? And you can have changes that result in impairment of the function of the tissue. You can have some hypertrophy and you can have some altered function um, that can impact your overall cardiac function and even increase your chances of developing congestive heart failure. And so beta blockers may play a role in preventing some of this um, remodeling, this harmful remodeling from occurring. Okay, so if somebody's on a beta blocker, right, that's on their list, you need to be thinking, do they have hypertension? Do they have some sort of tachyarrhythmia? Have they had an MI in the past? Or are they being treated for congestive heart failure? Because those are the primary things we see beta blockers used for. You guys, you guys okay with that? All right, moving right along. Calcium channel blockers. Okay, we have two major categories of calcium channel blockers. You have your dihydropyridines and your non-dihydropyridines. Okay. Your dihydropyridines, okay, are selective to vascular smooth muscle. So what do you suppose these are going to cause? Vasodilation. So if I want to treat blood pressure, if I want to lower somebody's blood pressure, a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker is indicated. Okay? Does that make sense? 
You guys, you guys okay with that? Okay. So the dihydropyridines are more selective to vascular smooth muscle. Okay. And the two major examples that I want you guys to know are amlodipine, which is also known as Norvasc, and nifedipine, which is also known as Procardia, trade name. Okay, so amlodipine and nifedipine are two classic examples of dihydropyridines. So if somebody has SVT, would you treat them with a dihydropyridine? No. No. Okay, dihydropyridines are not selective to cardiac muscle. They are selective to smooth muscle in the vessels. You guys, you guys okay with that? Okay. And because they can cause vasodilation, that vasodilation may actually cause a reflex tachycardia. So giving these agents may actually cause your heart rate to increase paradoxically. Okay. Um, an example of a dihydropyridine that is only found in, mostly, mainly only found in the hospital, is something known as nicardipine or cardine. And this is a continuous infusion, okay, that's given in the hospital. Um, these two up here are home meds, but the cardine or nicardipine is a continuous infusion that you would run into in, in, with an admitted patient. Okay, you guys okay with that? All right. Now, the non-dihydropyridines, okay, their, their selectivity may uh, include the heart and vascular smooth muscle, but it's a little more complicated. Your non-dihydropyridines fall into two primary classes, the benzothiazepines that's benzothiazepine, not benzodiazepine, right? It's benzothiazepine. And your phenylalkylamines, or your phenylalkylamines, however you want to announce that. Okay? Your benzothiazepines are both vascular smooth muscle and cardiac tissues. So the benzothiazepines are going to cause vasodilation and they're going to decrease your heart rate. You guys okay with that? In addition to contractility, et cetera. The classic example of a benzothiazepine that I want you guys to know is diltiazem, also known as cardizam. This is one that you guys actually carry. That's actually carried here in the Las Cruces area, okay? And then your phenylalkylamines are highly selective to cardiac tissues, okay? So these are not selective to vascular smooth muscle. So you have high selectivity to vascular smooth muscle here on the dihydropyridine spectrum. You have both vascular and cardiac with benzothiazepines and cardiac specific with the phenylalkylamines. And the one that you need to know is verapamil or Kalan. Okay. So if you want to impact the heart, you want all of your effort to go to the heart, you would choose a phenylalkylamine, right? If you wanted all of your effort to go to blood vessels, you'd choose a dihydropyridine. And if you wanted a mix, you would choose a benzothiazepine. Does that make sense? Okay, how the calcium channel blockers work, where they're selective. Okay, diltiazem, verapamil, amlodipine, and nifedipine um, are all home meds as well as injectable meds that we could use in EMS, okay? So, uh, or, uh, well, amlodipine and ifedipine, not, not so much. They are almost exclusively oral, okay? So how do calcium channel blockers work? Just a review. They block L-type calcium channels, and these channels in vascular smooth muscle and um, heart. And so what can they do? Well, they can decrease your heart rate. They can decrease AV conduction, okay, conduction through the node. They can decrease afterload, cardiac contractility, and that can lead to a decrease in blood pressure. Okay. So what would, we use, what would we treat with? Well, many of the same things beta blockers are used to treat. Hypertension, tachyarrhythmias, chronic CHF, Raynaud's phenomena. What is Raynaud's phenomena? Yeah. Yes. Uh, 
Yeah. Is a vasospastic disorder. Yeah. It causes per, it causes your peripheral vessels to spasm, and that can decrease blood flow to your extremities. And so, people that have this can actually develop blue cyanotic extremities due to shunting of blood away from them due to the vasospasm. Huh? Can some people can get chest pain? Their coronary, yep, vessel spasm. Yep, their kidneys, their kidneys can take a hit, the liver, brain, yeah, all those, yeah. So what type of calcium channel blocker might be helpful for vasospasm, this type of? Your dihydropyridines may be, may be very helpful, yeah. Maybe your benzothiazepines as well. Yeah, verapamil. Well, you, you, you seem to have more of a cardiac. Um, but yeah, verapamil will not affect vascular smooth muscle, though. It just won't really touch it. It's real specific to the heart. And then people that have angina, right? That have angina as well. You guys okay with that? That makes sense? All right. Cool. Moving right along. Anticoagulants and antiplatelets. Here's aspirin. Aspirin is an antiplatelet, right? So it prevents platelet aggregation. Okay. Some other examples. Warfarin or Coumadin. You guys should be familiar with this. All right. Coumadin works by what? Inhibiting vitamin K, dependent coagulation, right? So you inhibit vitamin K, and that's actually a, a clotting factor um, in your uh, coagulation uh, cascade. What you want to know about warfarin, many side effects, okay, and many drug interactions. If you have an overdose and you're over-anticoagulated, you can treat it with vitamin K or fresh frozen plasma. And anybody who takes warfarin or Coumadin needs frequent blood draws, sometimes on a weekly basis, and these are sometimes known as Coumadin clinics. Okay, guys, guys okay with that? All right. Um, good deal. And one thing that I want you to know is the labs that specifically look at Coumadin are PT and INR. Okay, those are examples of, of coagulation labs that we run. The PT, the, that's a prothrombin time, and the INR is the international normalized ratio. Okay, those two labs are used to monitor um, how anticoagulated somebody is on warfarin. The, the new one that came out. We'll talk about those. All right, because I have a, a buddy that's taking yeah. it right now. Yep, we're going to talk about those because they're, all, they're a little different. Oh. They're a little different, yeah. Um, but are you guys okay with warfarin, Coumadin? Lots of drug interactions, even food like grapefruit. They can be a bad uh, interaction with grapefruit, fruit. lots of herbal over-the-counters, ginkgo, those kinds of things, lots, multiple interactions and side effects. So warfarin's a, kind of a tricky one. The next one is Plavix. It's also known as Clopidogel. Um, this is also an antiplatelet. And this is commonly given following an acute coronary syndrome or PCI to prevent um, reclotting of that, that area that got opened up, or what we call restenosis. Okay, heparin. Okay, heparin is an anticoagulant as well. This is an example of an adjunctive therapy. What is adjunctive therapy? Something else. Right, it's an adjunct to, to what, though? And we talked, this, this is what, uh, they talked about this in ACLS last week. Yes, adjunctive therapy for an acute coronary syndrome. So your primary therapy is your MONA. Your MONA in either fibrinolytics or PCI, right? Those are your primary interventions. And then you have all these adjunctive interventions that can be added that may or may not be helpful. That includes things like heparin, right? Um, it might include a glycoprotein inhibitor. It might include beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, um, all those adjunctive things um, in addition to the primary things that need to get done. Okay. Heparin is also used uh, to flush certain vascular access devices. So somebody has a central line in place, a port cath or a PIC line or something like that, um, heparin may be used to flush that line to prevent it from clotting. You guys, you guys okay with that? Um, with heparin, we monitor the PTT. Okay, so remember, warfarin is the PTINR. Heparin is the PTT, or the partial thromboplastin time. 
Okay. Anybody who receives heparin is going to be at risk for something called HIT, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. What is thrombocytopenia? That is a low... No. So penia means low levels in the blood, right? And then thrombocytes are... What are thrombocytes, also known as? Platelets, so low blood platelets. So uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15% of patients who receive heparin will develop heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Their platelet levels will get low. So you also want to watch their platelets. If there is an overdose, that overdose gets reversed with protamine sulfate. Okay, that is the, a reversal agent for heparin. So warfarin and heparin have good um, reversal agents. And then there is a low molecular form of heparin. Okay, it's called low molecular weight heparin, or LMWH. And the common one is something known as Lovenox or anoxaprid. Okay, and this is commonly given subcutaneously in the abdomen. And the, one of the common uses for this is in patients who are admitted to the hospital or have had some major surgery. And this is to prevent pulmonary embolisms. So they will get um, a dose of this a day, generally sub-Q in their abdomen, okay? And they'll get that to prevent the development of something known as a DVT. What's a DVT? Deep vein thrombosis, right? And those DVTs can break off and go to the lungs and cause pulmonary emboli, okay? So people that are admitted or have had major surgeries will often get um, low venoxis, low molecular weight heparin to prevent that. So it's common with ad admitted patients. All right. And finally, we, or not finally, but next we have our glycoprotein platelet inhibitors. These inhibit specific glycoproteins on the surface of, of the platelets that, that, that is it the 2A, the 2B, um, I believe specifically. And these are used to treat n -stemies. These are adjunctive therapy for n -stemies. These are only infusions. Okay, so we see these only in admitted patients. And the two major examples that you want to be familiar with are Integralin and Agrostat. Okay. Integralin seems to be a commonly used one in this area. And then finally, as, as uh, someone alluded to, there are some new anticoagulants on the market that um, are marketed to replace warfarin. So let's talk about them. What's the good? Well, the good is far less inter interactions in warfarin. Okay, so if somebody's on one of these new anticoagulants, they don't have to worry about food and drug interactions like they do with warfarin. That's cool. That's really good. There is no need for close monitoring of coagulation profile with these. So they don't need to have weekly blood draws. They don't need to have Coumadin clinics. Okay, really good. What's the con? Well, the cons, the major one is there are no reversal agents. So if somebody has a bleed, okay, they start bleeding into their brain, for example, there is no way to reverse the anticoagulant effect of these drugs. So that's kind of a big con, right? Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Um, the three ones that I want you to be familiar with are Pradaxia, that's also known as dabigatrin, okay, Zeralto, and Eloquis, okay. So Pradaxia, Zeralto, and Eloquis, and y your friend's probably on one of those three. Zeralto. Zeralto, we okay. There you go. Um, so now you know a little more about he was, he's uh, taken. It was, second, it was a DVT secondary to orthopedic knee yep. surgery. Yep, We had a, um, two years ago, we had a paramedic student who, uh, um, sprained his ankle playing basketball um, and ended up uh, getting, they put him in a splint and he ended up developing a, a DVT and he was on, um, I believe, uh, Dabigatrin is what they put him on. Um, it was either Pradaxia or Zeralto, I, for, I forget which one, but yeah. He did fine though, he was on it for I think six six months um, and he did fine, but yeah. These haven't gone um, generic yet, right? 
Not that I'm aware of. These are really new the last few probably, years. Probably gonna see Fredoxa, or Zeralto, uh, yeah, Eloquiz, or Eloquiz, yeah. Names. Yeah, because these are so new, yeah. All right. So you guys okay with that? All right, moving right along. Uh, diuretics. Let's talk about diuretics. We have four different flavors of diuretics. You have non-potassium sparing, potassium sparing, osmotic, and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Okay. When dealing with cardiac uh, problems, your non-potassium and your potassium sparing are going to be the more relevant categories. So your potassium sparing diuretics, your two categories, you've got your loop diuretics and your thiazides. Your loop diuretics work on the loop of Henley. Henley. How about that? Cool. And your thiazides. All right. The major loop diuretic that you need to know is ferrosamide or Lasix, which is actually in our scope of practice. And the major thiazide is HCTZ, which is also known as hydrochlorothiazide. Hydrochlorothiazide or HCTZ. These are used to treat hypertension and congestive heart failure. How about that? Um, what do we need to know? Hypokalemia is a, is a risk with these, right? So with the sodium-potassium exchange that happens, um, you end up losing a lot of potassium in addition to sodium. Um, so what do they need? They need potassium supplementation. So if somebody's on a non-potassium uh, sparing diuretic, they should be on something like, called like chlorcon. Chlorcon or potassium chloride, okay, some sort of potassium supplementate, supplement. There are many different names for um, the potassium chlorcon, KCL, potassium chloride. Um, but how do you know it's, it's, it's an electrolyte that they're receiving? Well, electrolytes are not dosed in grams, milligrams, micrograms, et cetera. They're, no, anything charged, right? When something's charged and, it's, and it becomes an electrolyte, what do we measure it in, huh? Uh, it's related to moles, but it takes into account oh, mole. There you go, milliequivalents. M E Q, milliequivalents. You tend to have 10 to 20 milliequivalent tablets of potassium. You guys okay with that? All right. Um, people that are at risk for hypokalemia. Um, and, and it's hard to control, we may actually opt to put them on a potassium sparing diuretic. And these block the action of aldosterone, which is a hormone. And the one that you want to know is spironolactone. Okay, these are used to treat the same things as your potassium sparing, um, but they don't work on the sodium-potassium um, exchangers. They work on um, aldosterone. They block aldosterone receptors. However, with these, your patients need to avoid potassium-rich foods, okay, because they hold on to potassium. Um, salt substitutes are a major, major problem, right? People that, and often, because these people have congestive heart failure, what kind of diet are they on? A low-sodium diet, right? Less than, you know, 2.2 2, 2 .2 grams a day. So they may use... Salt substitute, right? And what are salt substitutes full of? Well, potassium instead of sodium. Yeah, um, that could be a problem in patients that take potassium sparing diuretics. So, do you see how there are many opportunities when you're talking to your patient about their meds? You're going through their med list and you're like, hey, you're taking spironolactone. Well, what's your diet like? What do you eat? Did you add anything new? Oh, yeah, there's, you know, that my doctor said I need to lower my sodium and I'm taking this substitute. And you look at that like, oh, my goodness, how much of this are you taking? And then you do a 12 lead and you see these tall T waves. You're like, oh, okay, I see what's going on here. Um, so knowing a little bit about whole meds and pharmacology um, can really help you out when it comes to developing a differential diagnosis list. Um, these other two are not really commonly used for cardiovascular disorders. I tack them on just for the sake of completion. But... You have osmotic diuretics that are, are um, osmotically active molecules that pull fluids from cells. These are, these are typically used to treat elevated intracranial pressure, so cerebral edema. Um, mannitol or osmotrol is the one that you want to know. That's one of the major 
um, osmotic diuretics. Um, the thing to know about this is if you're going to carry it or give it, you have to have a filter and it has to be in a warmer. If it gets cool, it, it tends to uh, crystallize and precipitate. Um, so mannitol must be warmed and it must be given through a filter. So some real special circumstances there. And then the other one is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. What is carbonic anhydrase? Well, if it ends with ASE, it's a what? Enzyme, yeah. Right? You guys remember this, our old friend. Talked about, about him slash her, it, in pathophysiology. Well, carbonic anhydrase. Doesn't it bind to Yeah, there you go. It's the enzyme involved in carbon dioxide combining with water to make carbonic acid, right? Yeah. That is car carbonic anhydrase catalyzes that reaction. It also catalyzes that reaction in reverse. It ca catalyzes um, the uh, breakdown, um, if you will, um, or the recombining of, of um, bicarbonate and hydrogen ions to make CO2 so you can exhale. So it happens at the cells and the tissues in, in, in the lungs as well. Um, but if you inhibit carbonic anhydrase, you actually have a diuretic-like effect, okay? And the one that you want to know is acetylzolamide or diamox. That is one of the classic carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. And we tend to use this as treatment for elevated intraocular pressures. So somebody has elevated pressures inside of their eyes, these may be helpful. And altitude sickness, believe it or not. Why? Because if you inhibit carbonic anhydrase, you will induce a mild metabolic acidosis. And what will happen to your respiratory rate, your rate and depth of breathing if you have an acidosis? Yeah, you're going to increase your rate and you're going to increase your, your depth. Right, so you're going to ventilate, you're going to oxygenate and ventilate better at altitude. All right, you guys okay with that? All right, along here. ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. Very common drugs, very common. So if it is a PRIL, P-R-I-L, it's typically an ACE inhibitor, okay? Some common examples are lisinopril and enelopril. Lisinopril is also known as Zestaril, and Enelopril is also known as Vasotec. You guys okay with that? There are some risks with these. There is a risk for angioedema. That's a swelling of your, air, uh, of your soft tissues in your airways. How would we treat this if they have that angioedema? You'd think so, wouldn't you? Unfortunately, this angio, this type of angioedema is not immune modulated, and so it will not respond to epinephrine. So if somebody has angioedema that results from a, an ACE inhibitor, nope. Huh? No. Their airways are swelling up, right? Their tongue's swelling up. Their mucous membranes are swelling up. Yeah. They need an airway. Huh? Yeah. No. It's not immune modulated. You cannot treat it like an anaphylaxis, even though it presents similar with the angioedema. Um, epinephrine will not, they will not respond to epinephrine. So they need, they, they may potentially need a definitive surgical airway. So you're just going to have to do the RSA on the titan? You're going to have to support them the best you can. Right, and then um, you might have to move on to a surgical airway if uh, their airway closes off. Yes. Now, luckily, that's a very rare thing. It's like 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 less than one percent, I think. But you know, luckily, it's it's very rare. So, you guys okay with that? Um, a more common side effect is a chronic cough. These people can develop a real chronic cough and <laughs> kind of have this dry cough. Um, these are used primarily to treat hypertension and congestive heart failure. Very, very commonly used for CHF. Now, if patients don't tolerate these very well, there are what are called angiotensin receptor blockers. 
that block the receptors for angiotensin. And these are valsartan and losartan, okay? And, you, and these may be used for people um, that don't tolerate ACE inhibitors. And I just want to review this thing real quick. Remember we talked about this in pathophysiology. This is the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone cascade. Just review this real quick, how it works. So how does it work? Well, it starts at the kidney here, right? And you have decreased perfusion to your kidneys. And your kidneys, in response to not being perfused, will release a hormone called renin, right? That renin gets released into your blood, and it causes angiotensinogen in the blood to be converted to angiotensin 1. You guys okay with that so far? And then angiotensin 1 circulates to your lungs where an enzyme called angiotensin-converting enzyme turns the angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 is the active form of angiotensin, right? And it causes vasoconstriction, right? Angiotensin 2 causes vasoconstriction, which does what to your blood pressure? Increases your blood pressure. Angiotensin 2 also causes... Okay, the pituitary gland, okay, your brain, to release another hormone called, stop it, called aldosterone. You guys okay with that? And aldosterone causes you to hold on to water. So at, collectively, you're vasoconstricting, you're holding on to water. What's that going to do to your blood pressure? Increase your blood pressure. Hopefully, that'll increase the renal perfusion. And then you have what's known as a negative feedback, right? Once the renal perfusion normalizes, you stop secreting renin, okay, and the system shuts off. Where do ACE inhibitors work? They work right here. They inhibit this enzyme in the lungs, the angiotensin-converting enzyme. And that prevents angiotensin 1 from being converted to angiotensin 2. So you disrupt this cascade. And what does that do? Well, it causes you to lose water and causes some vasoconstriction or vasodilation. So what does that do to your blood pressure? Drops your blood pressure. So ACE inhibitors have an indirect diuretic-like effect. When you put someone on ACE inhibitor, it will indirectly cause diuresis. You guys, you guys okay with that? Does, it, does that, that kind of make sense? Okay. Okay. So far, so good. ACE inhibitors are also a good option when you want to control blood pressure, but you don't want to impact the heart, right? Can a beta blocker decrease blood pressure? Yes, but at what cost? Often at the cost of decreasing the heart rate. Well, what if you're an active person? Yeah, you want your heart to be able to respond with, you know, you want to have a tachycardic response, right? So ACE inhibitors may be a better option for certain people where you don't want to impact their heart. You want to focus on their blood pressure. You want to focus on getting rid of excess fluid, right? Does that, does that make sense? Why an ACE inhibitor may be a better option in some patients than beta blockers or calcium channel blockers? Yeah? Have there been any long term Yes. Seems like the kidneys are like, hey, I need more blood, and then we're giving them a drug that says no Believe it or not, um, um, ACE inhibitors may be protective in people with renal insufficiency. Oh, okay. Because it may protect the kidneys from the effects of hypertension. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, some people will actually put them on an ACE inhibitor if we see that they have some renal insufficiency. Um, now, if they have, if the renal artery is diseased, they have renal artery stenosis, um, ACE inhibitors are actually contraindicated. That, that could actually take their kidney out. Okay, you guys okay with that? You okay with ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers? Almost. All right, lipid and cholesterol lowering agents. You have three major categories here. You have your statins. You have your fibrates and you have your omega-3s. So let's stop, start talking about the statins. Okay, these are common. You guys have probably seen these. These are so common. Okay, so atorvastatin or Lipitor? 
Very common. Lots of people take Lipitor. Lovastatin, okay. Um, these are known as Meva or Altacor, okay. Uh, Crestor as well. Zocor, Simvastatin, really common, okay. And then you can have a um, Simvastatin and Ezetimib, uh combination, and that's known as Vitorin, which is kind of a newer combo drug. These are all statins, okay, and these all inhibit an enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase. Okay, so these are HMG-CoA uh, reductase inhibitors, and essentially what they do is they block cholesterol synthesis pathways in the liver. Okay, so they prevent your liver from synthesizing um, cholesterol. Um, there are some side effects. There is an increased risk for rhabdomyolysis or lysis in these patients. Okay, it may be more common in patients that take statins. And statins are notorious for increasing your liver enzymes, or what we call your LFTs. That stands for liver function test. Okay? But they may help stabilize plaques, and they may even modulate inflammation and decrease inflammation of your vessels. So in addition to uh, decreasing um, cholesterol and lipid levels, they may have some plaque stabilizing and inflammatory modulating effects. But the side effects, rhabdomyolysis and um, impact on your liver, um, can be very problematic. Okay, So it's a risk-benefit thing, but lots of people take these statins, and uh, you should be able to identify some of the, the classic um, examples. Okay, so... The next group are the fibrates, okay? The big one that I want you guys to know is gemfibrozil, or Lopid. And its mechanism of action is not well elucidated, okay? It may interact with a peroxisome proliferator um, enzyme. This is also known as a PPAR, or peroxamase proliferator activated receptor. And basically what happens is... Um, these drugs may activate these genes. Um, and as we learned in pathophysiology, some genes are kept in an inactive state in our body, right? Or most genes are, right? They're, they're, they're inactive and um, they can be activated by various types, various events or effects, things like that. Um, so what we think these drugs may do is they may activate these genes that then cause an increase in lipid metabolism. You metabolize, you catabolize, catabolize these and break these lipids down and get rid of them. That is one um, way they may work. And then finally, we have our omega-3s, and the one that I want you guys to know is omega-3 acid ethyl ester, um, also known as Lovasa. Okay. You guys okay with that? Lovasa? All right. These are basically highly concentrated fish oils. Okay, they're highly concentrated omega threes. Okay, these are, are, are your quote unquote good fatty acids. Um, they tend to decrease your overall lipid count in your bad fats, i.e., your LDLs and your VLDLs. Okay, you guys okay with that? The fibers. Uh huh. Um, I'm not sure entirely. I'm not entirely sure what the what the preference is, um, because we we don't quite have the mechanism fully elucidated. Yeah. Um, and then I just want to review some quick terminology. So what is hyperlipidemia? Increased lipids, right? Hypercholesteremia is an increase in cholesterol, and then you have HDL, LDL, VLDL. And then you guys are okay with arterial versus atherosclerosis? Okay, cool. All right, I believe this is the last one. These are additional um, antidysrhythmics. Digoxin, very common. This is a class of cardiac glycoside. How does it work? What well, works, it's kind of convoluted, but it inhibits the sodium-potassium pump, in, primarily in myocardial cells. Okay, that causes an increase in intracellular sodium ions because you're not pumping sodium out of the cells efficiently. So intracellular sodium ions accumulate, 
And within the myocardial cell, you have another pump called this sodium calcium exchanger. Okay? And the increase in sodium ions causes a reversal of this exchanger because those ions are increasing. And that causes an increase in intracellular calcium ions. So cal instead of being pumped out of the cell, calcium ions um, stay in the cell. Okay? And what does this do? Well, this appears to increase vagal tone, increase contractility, decrease heart, and decrease conduction through the AV junction. Okay, so basically it is a negative chronotrope. What's that mean? Decreases rate and a positive inotrope, which is increased contractility. Good. So what is uh, digoxin or linoxin often used to treat? Yes, atrial fib, tachydysrhythmias. And it is also a secondary agent for treating congestive heart failure. Okay, because it does have positive inotropic effects. Unfortunately, the risk for toxicity is high, and we've talked about this in, in the EKG interpretation already, particularly if your potassium is imbalanced. And oftentimes, we don't see people that just take digoxin, right? They're on digoxin, they're probably going to be on other medications, right? What other medications? Have you seen the CPR masks? Just the masks are reusable, no? No, there's a big box. There was a big box in the... Of used ones? Oh, of used ones? Yeah. No, just new no. ones. Okay, yeah. No okay, sorry, man. Um, what are they typically going to... Like, if they're on, in CHF and they're on DIG, they're probably going to be on a beta blocker, probably going to be on a diuretic, right? Um, so their, their risk for interactions, their risk for potassium imbalances and whatnot are going to be a lot higher. Um, what's the classic symptom of toxicity? Visual changes, right? Yeah. Green, yellowish halos in your vision. And then finally, the last drug that I want to talk about is amiodarone or cordarone. How does this work? Well, you guys have probably up to this point have been, been told that it is a potassium channel blocker, right? It is, but it also has beta blocker and calcium channel blocker-like effects as well. So it's actually a very com complicated uh, number of effects. What do we commonly use amiodarone for? Antidysrhythmic. Now, is amiodarone a home a oral med? Yes. Yes, that's why I included it in here. Okay, it is an oral med that people can take. So it is not simply um, a med that we give sometimes. Okay, that's why I said the emphasis on this, this particular lecture is on medications that people take, that people are prescribed. Okay, so yes. Um, so we can use it to treat atrial fibrillation, ventricular ectopy, so uh, uh, problematic PVCs, uh, VTAC, VFib. But what you need to know about this is there is a very high risk for toxicity and side effects. Okay, and we're going to talk about some of them. Um, we've already talked about the prolonged QT interval and the torsade de Pont connection. But there are two other things that amiodarone is notorious for causing. One of them is pulmonary toxicity, and it can cause pulmonary fibrosis, the restrictive lung disease. Okay. And then the next one is... Amiodarone is actually chemically very similar to thyroxine, and thyroxine is thyroid hormone. And so people that are put on amiodarone are going to be at high risk for hyper and or hypothyroidism. They're going to be at high risk for thyroid problems. They're going to be at high risk for pulmonary toxicity, and they're going to be at high risk for torsade de pointe due to possible pro prolongation of the QT interval. So as you might imagine... There are lots of side effects, lots of danger um, associated with giving amiodarone that you want to be on the lookout for, right? So if you pick somebody up and they, and, they, and they have a heart rate of 230 and their blood pressure is 180 over 110 and you happen to see amiodarone on their drug list, what is uh, something you need to put on your differential diagnosis based on the, the information I just gave you? Huh? Well, what kind of, what, what kind of problem, though? Maybe.
Uh, you don't know. You, you, they're, they're attacking. They're, you're, you, you feel their heart rate. It's 210. Their blood pressure is 180 over 110. Maybe. What, what would be the obvious problem there that you'd want to put on your list of differentials? What is it chemically related to? Thyroxin. Thyroid storm. Thyrotoxicosis. Hyperthyroidism. Good. Yeah. Good deal. Good deal. All right. Um, good.